Hello and welcome to Alan History Note. In this video I'm going to be looking at foreign policy under Truman, so 1945 through to 1952. And this is the period following the end of World War I in which the US starts to really establish itself as the, the, a dominant world superpower. So it's a really important moment for the creation of doctrines and ideas that are going to set the kind of the baseline for American foreign policy for a long time following this. Notably the Truman Doctrine, we're also going to see the Marshall Plan, we're going to see events in Europe including uh, the uh, Berlin, blo the Berlin uh, blockade and the airlift and we're also going to see um, the, the idea of containment and we're going to see issues in, in um, the policy in Asia in particular uh, leading to the Korean War. So th this is a vital period of US foreign policy and Truman and his ideas are really significant as well. So this is designed uh, for the A-level um, specification of the American dream um, and this is uh, this is kind of what the spec tells us we need to know about this one. So um, the USA is a superpower, Truman's character and policies, post-war peacemaking, the Cold War and containment in Europe and Asia and the response to the rise of communism in Asia. So essentially I'm going to try and go through and look at all those different bits. So you've got all the key information that you need for this element of the specification if you're studying uh, this for A-level, but also if you're not and you just want a good understanding of, of, of American foreign policy during this period, hopefully uh, this video will give you a good understanding of all the different bits going on and why they were happening. So to start off with, we're going to look at uh, Truman's character and policies. So Truman is not Roosevelt, and I, I, I think that's probably the most important element really of this early on. So he, he lacked experience in foreign policy. He, he had a, a very kind of blunt, straightforward, and the Americans also talk about this, like a southern style. And, and they, this, in a lot of ways, made him a lot of friends, particularly at home. People people back in the states could relate to this they understood the kind of the way that he talked about things and the way that that he approached them um there is a potential or there was a potential at this point that, that this kind of straight shooting straight talking um american president potentially is going to cause difficulties at the time where a degree of charm and tact and diplomacy was needed now in those areas roosevelt really was a master so so Truman, this is potentially going to grate with some of the people he's going to be trying to negotiate with because he, he's going to approach it, things in a very different way uh, to Roosevelt. Now, to reinforce this, he, he was strongly anti-communist and he was much less willing to work with Stalin than Roosevelt had been. I mean, part of it is the necessity of working with Stalin kind of goes by the time, uh, to the same extent it, go, it goes by the time that, that Truman's in place. Uh, I mean, given everything to do with um, Stalin and his regime, then you can uh, definitely appreciate Truman's view viewpoint on this in terms of his complete lack of trust of, of Stalin and not want to work with him. And Truman kind of captures the American mood at this point in terms of his really strong anti-communist feelings. He's best known uh, for the Truman Doctrine, uh, and this was the, the, this idea, this doctrine, that the US should give support to any country threatened by Soviet forces or communist insurrection. Uh, and it's first expressed by Truman in a, in a speech in 1947 to Congress, where he's, he's talking about the need to aid uh, Greece and Turkey, and Greece in particular. Um, the, there was communist insurrection and, and the belief that it was uh, being backed by the Soviets, whether that's true or not, it, it, it was kind of a bit by the by in terms of the ideas and the doctrine. So the Truman Doctrine is, is essentially setting the tone for the Cold War and, and setting the setting the US ideology going into the Cold War that they, they wanted to stop communism spreading. And so they would um, they, they would stand in the way of expansionist policies uh, from Soviet Russia, but also if communism was rising up within uh, nations that they would act to kind of stamp it out and, and to back democratic free free kind of capitalist US style governments or, or, or parties that were in those countries that were combating against the rise of communism. So the Truman Doctrine is really, really important. A, a, a really key figure uh, at the time was was a guy who goes on to become State uh, Secretary of State, a guy called 
uh, Dean Ashton, uh, Ashton. Um, he, he believed in the Truman Doctrine. He believed in the domino theory, uh, which is the idea that, that if, if one country fell to communism, then the country bordering it were likely to then fall after it. And that this was like a domino effect that would ripple through uh, an area or, or, or region. Uh, and he was part of the group that, in, that produced uh, NSC 68, which uh, proposed a shift in defence spending uh, from $13 billion to fifteen to $50 billion in the, uh, following the, the USSR testing of nuclear weapons in 1949. So we, we can see in all of this, we've got Cold War doctrine of the, Tr the Truman Doctrine. We've got the beginning of the arms race uh, with the USSR successfully testing nuclear weapons in 49. Uh, and we've got this ramping up of defense spending because of that. Another person that, that Truman trusted and, 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 and worked with uh, was Churchill, who, who described uh, a, this idea of an iron curtain falling across Europe. And, and that that is very much how Truman saw things as, as, a, as a kind of US and allies against the USSR and their communist allies. And, and therefore that gives us a really important insight into the reasons why we're going to see the policies that we're going to look through in a second. So some of this stuff, and again, this is it's important to know that you don't just start with Truman. Obviously, we need to, to look at, at the stuff that just kind of um, goes before him. And, and we're going to look at all the peacemaking moves uh, following World War Two. Now, some of this is, is you've, you've got conferences whilst the war is still going on. Uh, and and the first of these really big ones, the meeting of the, the big three, you can see them above me, Churchill, Roosevelt and Stalin, uh, took place in, in Yalta in February 1945. So Yalta is a, a Russian resort. Uh, and at this meeting, the relationship between Churchill and Stalin was very poor, but Roosevelt was able to and willing to work with Stalin. So they worked together and therefore progress was made. They agreed that, that uh, on taking uh, Germany, Germany would be divided into four zones, a US zone, a British zone, a French zone and a Russian one. Uh, free elections would be allowed in the liberated countries in Eastern Europe. And most importantly, one of the key focuses of, of discussion was about Poland, um, which obviously was key in the cause, causes and the, and the Western powers going to war, but also is that key buffer for the USSR sitting in between it and Germany. Um, Roosevelt was keen to persuade the USSR to join the war with Japan after Germany was defeated and Stalin agreed to this uh, and in return for um, for joining that war he would receive occupation zones both in North Korea and Manchuria which is part of China obviously the stuff in terms of the USSR getting land in North Korea is going to be enormously uh, important when we come to later ideas or later events like we look at the Korean War and the, the occupation zone in Manchuria is going to be very really important when we look at um, the issues with China uh, following World War II. Uh, the USSR was invited to join the United Nations which came into existence in October 45 and the USSR was one of the five permanent members of the Security Council. So what we are seeing is some slightly more joined up thinking, better thinking about um, creating organisations to, to ensure international peace than we did following uh, World War One, where we had the League of Nations, where all the or many of the key um, countries either weren't allowed to join or, or or didn't join. Now, this one, again, gives a degree of hope that that actually. Soviet Russia and the Western powers are going to be able to work together and this organisation the UN will help that. Uh, the big three agreed that Nazi war criminals would be tried after the war and a commission was set on, up, up on reparations. Now Stalin in particular was very very keen that Germany pay very very significant reparations and he wanted to essentially economically cripple it which again is understandable given the the terrible cost to to uh, russia and its people of the second world war and, and again the devastation that germany had caused and the, so we We've also on the other side, we've got we've got to look back at the history before this and go, well, the, the whole idea of reparations was kind of 
not particularly successful was it after World War One? So the next of the of these kind of key um, uh, peacemaking um, meetings were, was at Potsdam in uh, July and August uh, in in 1945. Uh, and again, this is is mainly centered around the big three, but the big three have, have changed because it's no longer Churchill. It, it is Attlee and it's not um, Roosevelt. It is Truman. However, it is still Stalin. Now, Truman lacked the charm and, and the, the kind of tact as Roosevelt and didn't have the relationship with Stalin. Um, and, and actually was quite determined to go a completely different way. He wanted to display himself as, as a strong man in international relations. And as some have argued this is because of if he's trying to to kind of take away from his lack of experience and people's concerns by demonstrating that he was strong and decisive. So he, he, him and, and, and Stalin are, and, are not on the same page um, very definitely. So there was more tension. There was far less agreed uh, at, at Potsdam than there had been at Yalta. Uh, and very, very significantly at this point, Truman did not discuss the plan to drop the atomic bomb on Japan. Uh, and the bombing of Hiroshima happened just four days after um, the, the conference ended. And, and so we can see there that, that really we, um, we, we're not getting a, a kind of... A, the proper cooperation, and maybe this is a warning of the Cold War that is to come. There is some confirmation of some things that had already been agreed at Yolder, so the, the zones of occupation, war criminals to be put on trial, um, free elections to be held in Poland. Obviously, this doesn't isn't something Stalin actually sticks to, but that, that was was confirmed at Potsdam. Um, they agreed that Germany and the Nazi in Germany, the Nazi party and the state was to be completely wiped out, taken uh, completely deconstructed, and and there would be a process of denazification amongst the German people through education and things like that. And, and then this idea of reparations was was answered to a degree, although this does all collapse because again the different sides not really sticking to it, particularly uh, Stalin. So the USR. Um, we could take reparations from their zone of occupation plus 10 percent of the industrial equipment in the western zones uh, and the U US and UK and, and France could take reparations from their zones and that was and supposed to be some kind of kind of agreement where where some of this stuff would be shared and, and Stalin essentially pillaged his zone and and took took the, the his 10 percent and and didn't reciprocate and so eventually this will collapse now the rest of the story of the kind of the post-war peacemaking is, well, it's just not very successful. It all kind of, and, and this may be not a surprise as we know that we're leading into the Cold War era. Um, so the, the Council of Foreign Ministers from the USA, uh, USSR, UK, China and France met in London in September 45. Uh, the aim was to draft the peace treaty. They didn't manage to achieve it. In December, the foreign ministers, the big three, so the US, the USSR and Britain, met in Moscow and they disagreed over what was going to happen in Iran in terms of Soviet withdrawal. In, in February 46, Stalin made a speech and he, he suggested that actually um, a war between communism and capitalism was inevitable, now that, which fits with Marxist teachings. Um, and, and it caused a great deal of, of, of concern in, in the West for very obvious reason, reasons. It led to what is known as the uh, the Long Telegram. Now, the Long tel Telegram was sent by um, George Keenan, who was a US diplomat in Moscow. Uh, and he called for the US to resist all, all degree of, of expansion by the USSR. So, so the USSR is expansionist. Uh, and it will push out. But you, what can happen is if you push back, you can contain it. You can stop it growing and spreading because ultimately what it's going to want to do is it's going to want to avoid full blown war. So he's saying, saying so the USSR wants to expand, but it doesn't want another massive war. So you can contain it. And that's what um, Kennan um, called for. And, and the long telegram is a really important staging post and, 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 and a, a kind of one of the key foundations of US Cold War foreign policy. In March 46, Churchill talked about the Iron Curtain as descending over Europe. And we, here we can see this very much the them and us bit and, and, and Churchill very much in line with the ideas of Truman. 
In June 46, the Council of Foreign Ministers met in Paris. Um, there was peace treaties regarding Romania and Bulgaria and Hungary and Italy and Finland, but nothing was actually agreed regarding Germany. So we've got these four occupied zones, but we haven't actually got any proper agreement what's going to happen. Now, obviously, after World War One, you'd had the Treaty of Versailles. Now, the Treaty of Versailles you, it is kind of the start and the causes of, of World War Two. But it, 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 is, it is not, again, what you'd expect after a major war to, to kind of fail to, to be able to agree a peace treaty regarding uh, one of the main antagonists. So we then move into this policy that comes back to the long telegram and to the Truman Doctrine, this idea of containment in Europe. And, and essentially, this starts with the, the desire to support those fighting against the communists in Greece and also this concern about rise the, the potential communist takeover in Turkey. Uh, and the, the, there was there was thought or I, the, the belief that there was Soviet backing. And so Truman asked Congress for four hundred million dollars uh, of economic assistance, which he pumps into Greece and Turkey uh, to try and prevent communist takeover there. And the Truman Doctrine is going to remain in place for the next 40, 50 years in US foreign policy opposing the spread of communism. And the doctrine is essential to the Cold War as it, as it places, as I've said before, the, the, the communists is in the role as the enemy and the US in the role as the protector of democracy and freedom. Now, this isn't, the, the Truman Doctrine could lead to military intervention, it could send, send to, to kind of forces being sent, um, the threat or use of military action. Now, this was then hand, put in hand in glove, really, with, with what was known as the Marshall Plan. And this was, it comes from, from George Marshall, who was Secretary of State. Um, it, it's not given Truman's name because it, it needed, it's about money. So if you need money as a president, you have to ask Congress for the money because Congress controls all the purse strings. And Truman believed, because of his unpopularity, that if he put anything to Congress with his name attached to it, essentially it would fail. Now, the idea of the Marshall Plan was financial aid for the European countries to get them back on their feet and resist the spread of communism. So Marshall Plan and, and Truman Doctrine you see together. Uh, and there was economic benefits of it as well. Now, Congress gave its backing to this largely uh, because of Czechoslovakia becoming communist in February 48. The money in the Marshall Plan was actually offered to all European nations, including all the communist ones, though so all the communist ones, including the USSR, turned down the money. Officially, it's not called the Marshall Plan. So you, you, again, you might find if you're reading sources and things on this, you, it, it is the Euro European Recovery Programme. And it gave $17 billion um, to European countries. Most of that money went into the UK, into France and into Germany. And, and these countries saw record economic growth. Now, you have to be careful with the statistics on this because that's record growth. Now, if you are looking at a group of countries that have been absolutely devastated by war and they, things get better, then the rate of growth is going to be uh, remarkably quick um, because it works on percentages. And if you're starting from a very low baseline, then... I mean, then it, it, the, the percentage is going to look really high. Obviously, it's going to take a period of time before those markets recover, even to the stage that they were at before World War Two. Though obviously the 1930s weren't a great time for, for these countries anyway because of uh, the Great Depression, etc. It also helps American the American economy, the, the government pump, the American government pumping all this money into Europe, because it opens up the uh, opens up Europe, makes Europe more affluent, and therefore uh, Europeans can buy American goods, and it builds markets for American goods, and therefore that has a knock-on positive economic effect for America. In, in Europe, probably the, the biggest event in all of this is the uh, the Berlin blockade and and the and the Berlin airlift. So in 48, the US and UK combined their zones and were discussing with France and combining their zone two and creating a united West Germany under a single government. Stalin saw this as a threat. Now, Berlin, capital of, which had been the capital of Germany, uh, was located in the Soviet zone, um, but had in itself been divided into four zones. 
Now, people moving between the zones in Berlin was causing Soviet problems, particularly because Western Berliners were a lot more affluent than their counterparts in East Berlin. Again, we talk about how essentially the USSR was taking and plundering the wealth out of the area of Germany that it controlled. And and the kind of affluent capitalism going on isn't something that that that, that Stalin wanted the others in East Germany to see, uh, and he felt he felt the degree of threat that, that essentially the, the, everybody else was joining up against him, so he blockaded Berlin. Now this was lawful. There was nothing saying that he had to allow land access um, to Berlin for the Allies. Um, and again, he's he's kind of trying to force the U.S. hand. So the U.S. He, he seemingly has an op, uh, two options. One is to give up, and the Western powers and give up Berlin. And and the other is that well, they've got to invade because if they're going to get there by land, they're going to have to force their way through Soviet-controlled East Germany. And Stalin was absolutely convinced that Truman wouldn't do this, so, and therefore he felt he kind of had him outsmarted. However, um, the, the US and Britain and others worked together to, to organise the airlift. So Truman ordered the supplying of Berlin by air. Some of this is on American um, planes, some of it's on British planes. And over the next 324 days, there are 275,000 flights, a million and a half tonnes of supplies. So Berlin is kept supplied. Um, in, in April 49, we see the creation of NATO. Uh, and this is the North Atlantic um, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and the idea of this was collective security, and, and it was seen that any attack on one member was an attack on all members. And essentially, it's an anti-Soviet pact by the U.S., Canada, and and Western European countries. The U.S. also de deployed B-29 bombers into Europe, which is significant because the B-29 bombers could carry atomic bombs, um, and. And when West Germany was admitted into uh, NATO in in 55, uh, this was um, reacted very strongly against by uh, by the Soviets, and we see the creation of, of, of kind of the counter to NATO, NATO, which is the Warsaw Pact, and again that's all part of the story of the, of the Cold War developing later on. In May 49, the blockade was lifted, and this was seen as a huge victory for Truman and his doctrine. And then this continues with with um, the creation of West Germany, and then in response to that, in October '49, we see the creation of East Germany, and we now have an 850 mile frontier between East Germany and West Germany, which, particularly on the East German side, becomes very quickly heavily guarded, heavily fortified, and mined, and all the rest of that. So we again. Churchill had, had spoken very had spoken in forty six about an iron curtain descending over Europe, and we're now seeing a a, a far far more kind of literal um, a, a kind of barrier now across uh, across Europe between West and East Germany. Next stage, I'm going to uh, look. I'm going to kind of shift focus, and we're going to move away from kind of what we're going on in 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 Europe and move over into Asia. I'm going to look at um, a, a series of, of, of different uh, nations, one after the other. I'm going to start with Japan. So, uh, in August '45, uh, the the second atomic bomb was dropped on Japan by the U USA. On the 14th of August, Emperor Hirohito um, surrendered. On the 2nd of September, General MacArthur accepted that surrender on his aircraft carrier, and we've then going to see 350,000 American troops occupy Japan, and that is led by uh, General MacArthur. And he is tasked with transforming Japan from this uh, kind of military state, which America has been war, at war with, into a modern democracy. And in, in it, and a, a constitution is created, and in that con constitution is, is built in this idea of, of, of renouncing war uh, as a, a method of foreign policy. So we're looking at occupation, we're looking at, at essentially the US looking to remodel Japan um, on its own te template, really. We then see um, a kind of a shift in the significance of Japan. First of all, we get the um, the communist revolution in China, 
and therefore China, Japan starts to become a, a key strategic importance um, to uh, to the Americans. And this then increases when in 1950 the Korean War breaks out. This then leads to a huge amount of American spending in Japan, particularly military spending, and this really boosts the Japanese economy. Now, American occupation of Japan ends in 52, and Japan goes on very quickly to, to massively industrialize and become a key economic figure and a player in the world. China then. So if we go back again a bit before our period, in 31, Japan had invaded China. There's two groups in China. There was the, the, uh, the nationalist led, led by Chiang Kai-shek um, and the communist led by Mao Zedong. Uh, and now they united to fight um, the Japanese. Now, the peace between these two groups collapsed in 1946. Uh, and China entered a period of civil war. Uh, and the, the Americans supported the nationalist uh, Chiang Kai-shek, and they, they, they did this to, to the cost of $2 billion. However, in 49, Mao and his communist forces won. Uh, Chiang fled to, tai, to Taiwan, and, and, and we get this nationalist Chinese, nationalistic Chinese government kind of in exile in Taiwan. Uh, with American backing. And from there, his government uh, represented China at the UN all the way through to 1971. But the real government in China is Mao's communist government. And this looks like a massive failure for Truman. So his doctrine here has has not worked. He, he hasn't stopped the advance of uh, communism. He hasn't American support for against communist insurrection has not been uh, strong enough. Um, the Republicans and lots of people in America talked about the loss of China, although actually America never had control of China, so loss seemed an odd way of looking at it. That's, you'll see sources and stuff from the time where that, that's how it's written about. There was blame placed on Roosevelt, um, uh, Roosevelt's treatment of China at Yalta, and if you remember that earlier in the video where where kind of bits of in Manchuria had been promised to the Soviets, and therefore essentially as allowing the Soviets and, and and communism in more of a foothold inside China. Um, there was also a, a, an argument that the America just hadn't intervened enough. Um, and then we, when we look at this more with domestic policy, but there's this idea of there were communists working within the State Department, and, and they essentially allowed this to happen. And fear grew of this idea of the domino effect in Asia, that essentially now China had fallen to communism, that communism would now spread on from China through other nations and, and across Asia. And if that happened, then containment would have failed and the, the, uh, and, the and Truman and his doctrine would have failed as well. And this then contributes to, to Truman acting differently in different parts of, of Asia to, to how uh, because of what had happened in China. So in Indochina, which is uh, or, or sometimes called French Indochina, which is essentially what goes on to become Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos, um, the, these had these were French colonies. Now in in 1930, Ho, uh, Ho Chi Minh had set up the Indo-Chinese uh, Communist Party and fought against French occupation. During World War II, Japan had invaded uh, the, the, this area and had, and had occupied it. And Ho Chi Minh's forces then fought against them. So they had been fighting against the French. They were now fighting against the Japanese. Now, at the end of the war, Ho Chi Minh expected support for his demands for independence. After all, the US had pledged support for self-determination across all uh, the old colonies and all the old empires. So this idea of self-determination was something America was pushing. So he, he thought, well, well, obviously, uh, we're fighting for our independence and we've been fighting against the enemy of um, the of the of the Americans and my enemy's enemy is my friend type idea, but the U.S. didn't back Ho Chi Minh. They they backed the French, covering over three quarters of their cost in 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 trying to keep control in, in uh, Indochina, uh, and Americans saw Vietnam as a crucial part of the Cold War, preventing the domino effect going further, and actually we can see from quite early on that greater 
US involvement seems inevitable as, as France um, doesn't have um, the strength to do this by itself and, and the determination of Ho Chi Minh and his followers. So again, we we can see essentially the ideas of the Truman Doctrine in, in, in place here and this fear of the domino effect and this idea of um, containment, though not necessarily very successful. Now, where this all then comes to a head is in Korea. Um, now, Korea, a bit like Germany, had been divided into two, into two halves with zones controlled by uh, the countries that liberated it um, from the Japanese. So the, the USR, USSR had liberated uh, Korea from the north and the US had liberated a uh, career from the south. And uh, at a kind of nominal, uh, nominal or notional border was created along the 38th parallel. Uh, and, and therefore you, you've got a North and a South Korea. Now, through working through the UN, they, uh, they tried to reunite um, the country into a, a single unified um, nation, but the USR uh, resisted this. And, and obviously that key figure in the UN, so without their agreement, it's not going to happen. In the South, the US helped organize elections uh, and Syngman Rhee won that. And you can see a picture of him right at the top of the screen. And in the North, uh, Kim Il-sung was placed in power by the USSR and, and he ruled um, North Korea until 94 when he was followed by his son, who's then been followed by uh, Kim Il-sung's grandson, who now uh, now controls North Korea. Now, Kim Il-sung claimed sovereignty over the entirety of Korea. Now, this is something that North Korea uh, still maintains to this very day. Um, the US troops left South Korea and when they had gone, a 100,000 strong North Korean army invaded. Now, how much Soviet the Soviets were behind that is it can be debated, but it, essentially this seems to have been a, a decision borne by, by his own ideology, uh, which was slightly different from um, the idea, ideology of, of communist Russia. So the, this went down to Kim Il-sung's ideas and his determination to, to kind of unify uh, Korea, but to unify it and obviously under his control. Um, the US then led a UN intervention that was headed by uh, General MacArthur again. So there were troops from other nations, but it was essentially a, the South Koreans and the US. So other nations involved, but largely um, the US and, and South Korean forces. And, and there's, there's a counterattack, uh, and they successfully pushed the North Koreans uh, well back, well beyond that 38th parallel. Um, and China then responded. And they responded because the, the um, China's just above North Korea. The UN US forces are approaching their border. And so China gets involved and pushes the South Korean forces back. So Truman was looking to unite Korea and roll back communism and gain a, a kind of a huge victory for, for his doctrine and going actually beyond his doctrine in, in actually taking a nation that was communist and turning it back into one that wasn't. Um, but the North Korean and Chinese forces pushed the US led troops backwards. Now, at this point, Truman and MacArthur uh, fall out. MacArthur wanted to attack China, fell out with um, the way that um, Truman was running the war. Uh, MacArthur called for the use of the atomic bomb. He openly complaining about Truman. Truman really, ha even though MacArthur is his kind of military hero in the US has, has no real option but to to to, to sack him, to, to relieve him of his command. Now Truman's approval rating at this point is at about 22% and he decides the, not to contest the, the 1952 election because he, he would have absolutely no hope of winning. And then in the Korean War the, the border again is roughly on the 38th parallel in, in when the war is ends or when an armistice is agreed in, in 53. And then we've now, then going to see that divide between North Korea, which has lasted all the way up until today. Essentially, nothing had been achieved during this period of time, uh, but 138,000 American men were either dead or injured. And so again, this can be seen as an area where Truman doesn't really succeed. Uh, and overall, there there's 
plenty, particularly in Asia, where treatment is seemingly far from successful. Now, you can argue there is a greater degree of success in Europe and probably the height of that success is the Berlin airlift. But overall, Truman sets some really important kind of groundwork in terms of American policy and his ideas, the Truman Doctrine and Marshall Plan, are really going to set the kind of the bedrock of a Europe of, of a US foreign policy. And there is important organizations created, such as the UN and NATO. But in, in Asia in particular, um, Truman's policies do not seem to have been enormously successful. Now, you can argue maybe in Japan um, there, there's been a lot more success, but in Indochina and in Korea, uh, far less so. I hope that's been helpful for you and given you uh, all the key information uh, that you need. So uh, this is a video as part of a playlist looking at um, the uh, American dream, a myth and reality going from 1945 through to 1984. And I will be adding to this uh, as time goes by uh, and, and hopefully eventually covering the entire unit. There are playlists on my channel, uh, Alan History Nerd, on a whole range of other um, topics, historical topics, and there's also uh, playlists on UK and US and ideo ideology in politics as well. So if you're studying A-level history or A-level politics, then there should be plenty on my channel uh, that can help you. If you've enjoyed the video, please hit like. Uh, if you haven't done, also, done already, then please do subscribe as there will be far more of these videos like this coming up. And if you turn on notifications, you'll find out about them and hopefully they can help you with your studies or just expand your understanding and knowledge uh, of this bit of history. Thank you very much for watching.